my name is John Madden, I'm the Director of Facilities Management of Royal Property. You're all very welcome to today for a client seminar on common building defects and moving your developments. Our speaker today is Pat McGovern from McGovern Severs. Pat has a charter building surveyor with 25 years experience in the area of building defect analysis at both property managers, landlords and tenants. Pat is the past chairman of the Society of Charter Surveyors Islands Building Surveying Practice Group. Pat has also led for nine years in building pathology at Dundalk at Dundal Institute of Technology. He now runs his own building surveying practice, McGovern Surveyors, which specializes in the area of professional services including structural surveys, schedules of dilapidations, schedule of condition, and general building defect analysis. And hand you over to Pat now. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John. Uh, you're all very welcome. It's great to get an opportunity to talk to you about uh, building defects. I know uh, you're probably wondering, some of you, what a building surveyor does, and uh, you put the word building defects and building surveyor in the one sentence, you're sure to uh, spoil a, a dinner party, as it were. Um, I came back from London in 91 and set up practice as a building surveyor, and a building surveyor is really a cross between, I suppose, an architect, an engineer, and a quantity surveyor. Um, and the building surveyor is trained in building pathology and they spend their time examining buildings, identifying defects, analyzing those defects and making recommendations for repair. But it doesn't just stop there, they would also um, monitor continually uh, the performance of a building and uh, monitor defects and repair methods. Today. I'm going to talk to you about a very small area of uh, building pathology and building defects, concentrating on the multi-unit developments and in particular apartment blocks. Uh, the presentation is quite short, it's about 20 minutes, and I think when talking to property managers like yourselves, uh, building defects are often best dealt with by questions and answers. So I think you're more than welcome to chip in with questions during the presentation, particularly on, on maybe some of the photographs if they, ra if, if they raise anything of, of interest, but we certainly would welcome uh, questions at the end and we can deal uh, with them then. Andrew Ramsey from the office is here with me as well who will, um, as it were, help me with the, the, the answers. Um, we're going to look at uh, some roofing issues, uh, condensation and some fire issues and then chat around identifying the defects and analysing them and then follow up with the questions and answers. So, uh, roofing issues, uh, a lot of roofing defects are down to uh, design issues, design problems, uh, also workmanship issues and I think you will know that yourselves from dealing with a lot of the newer buildings, particularly buildings uh, constructed in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, sometimes design is ill thought out and there's a lot of flat roofs and you have to ask yourself with the Irish weather why we would even consider uh, uh, building a flat roof but we seem to put them on every building they have various steps and different levels parapet walls penetrations so all challenging uh, the waterproof membrane also during the boom there was uh, a lot of poor workmanship, uh, particularly on uh, roof construction, where you had unskilled craftsmen working on the roof, very little uh, supervision, and uh, really no accountability. And that was all under the, the old building control regime. The new uh, building control um, system, where it provides for an assigned certifier, should certainly improve on that. But what we're dealing with now is uh, a lot of buildings with a lot of problems, with a lot of inherent uh, design and workmanship issues. So um, with the Irish weather and flat roofs, you can imagine as building surveyors, we're very busy trying to work out what the problems are. Um, <coughs> with roofs, everybody talks about warranties and having a 10-year warranty with a particular felt. Uh, generally, the warranties uh, that are worth relying on only relate to the roofing membrane itself, they only relate to the product. Uh, so always when you bring a manufacturer out to look at a problem, they can point to a workmanship issue or some reason why it's not uh, the fault of the membrane. And, and generally it is uh, a workmanship issue. 
Um, take a, a roof like that there, for example, you have probably six or seven different products, ranging from uh, felt to asphalt, lead, uh, zinc. I think there was some copper on it as well and some pressed metal flashings. Uh, there's several different levels on a roof like that. There's also several different penetrations through the roof covering. Uh, roof lights, uh, service penetrations for air conditioning units and uh, solar reflective units. Usually with a roof like that, the detailing to upstands will be of a poor quality or incorrectly done. And there will be issues of inadequate lapping and uh, inadequate sleeving of simple things like soil, soil vent pipes. Um, asphalt. Asphalt uh, is a very, very good product, uh, very reliable, long life, but it's, it's used very rarely today. Most roofs today are a single membrane ply covering or uh, something like trocol or, or some form of high performance felt covering. Uh, you, you never get something as reliable as asphalt. Um, a lot of roofs are done in lead as well, but if it's a big roof area that would be very expensive. Some are done in copper and zinc, again quite expensive, and the detailing tends to be quite poor on, on any new lead or copper roofs. Um, the thing about asphalt is it's quite easy to repair and it's easy to maintain. Whereas with felt, um, if you get a, a tear in the felt, you can patch it, but um, some of the problems with felt are identifying where the patch is. And I know we, we get spark tests done, which are quite helpful, but sometimes the preparation to get a spark test done is so expensive, particularly if you have an inverted roof with ins insulation, ballast, or whatever, uh, paving slabs on the roof. They all have to be cleared off to give you an, a, a reasonable area to carry out the, the spark test on. Um, here you have an example of, of a lot of uh, uh, services penetrations. You can see on the left photograph a uh, solar panel. The cables are coming through the parapet wall upstand now, a parapet upstand is usually partially dressed with felt from the roof covering where it's returned up the wall. There is then a counter flashing over it. But what happens when the services or the M&E guys come along is they, they have no regard uh, for the, uh, the, the functions or duties of the, of the uh, felt and the upstand, and they simply drill away, uh, bring the services, whatever is the shortest and easiest route. In addition to that, there will be a lot of traffic later in maintaining those services. So, and, and, and mostly on, on apartment buildings, there's nowhere else to put the services other than on the roof. So it does create a, a headache for property managers and uh, quite a, a maintenance liability. Um, so roofs, I suppose, will continue to challenge us all. And uh, uh, we can look a little bit later on on the benefits of a, maybe a maintenance plan for roofs. The second area I wanted to cover with you was condensation and mould growth in apartments. Condensation is probably the single biggest uh, problem in apartments, both for property managers, property owners and tenants. Um, very often uh, it's down to uh, poor housekeeping by the occupants um, and simple checks can sort that out but also uh, breaches of building regs in terms of ventilation are uh, a, a problem as well. Um, the result is quite a, a, an ugly mould growth um, and certainly if it's not maintained and cleaned regularly it will develop into something quite unsightly. So the first thing to do is to kind of rule out the usual suspects to, if it is a ventilation issue, check if the occupant has covered the wall vents. First of all, check if there is a wall vent. A lot of windows have proprietary vents fitted. And that, while that satisfies building regulations, it's not very effective in getting the required air changes to a room. Uh, blinds are fitted, curtains are pulled at night when the room is occupied and the air circulation is simply not happening. So the only real solution to that is a permanent vent. 
usually a nine inch square vent uh, on the wall. Um, so if, if that vent is there, check that the tenants haven't filled it with newspaper to stop the draft or what they perceive to be a draft. Um, the second thing, uh, cold bridging. Uh, a lot of you will be familiar with that because it seems to come up quite a lot on apartment surveys. Very difficult to identify it just from walking around because most walls, like the walls here, will be dry lined with plasterboard and you can't see where the insulation is. Um, there are reasonably handy um, thermographic imaging cameras that will give some indication. The heating needs to be on in the apartment for about two hours before you try out one of those. And the most reliable is to get uh, a builder in to cut a slot in the plasterboard, a small area to check, particularly around, around window reveals and at skirting board, board level to ensure that there is a uniform and fully covered wall with, with insulation. And um, it's difficult to remedy cold bridging without you know, causing destructive work internally, but it may only be window reveals. Or if you're in an apartment ground floor over a car park, it may be effective to line the soffit of the car park with Kingspan composite or Kingspan um, uh, high density polyurethane board. But it's not enough often in that case to just line the soffit of the ceiling. If there are drop beams around the perimeter, they will need to be lined also for it to be fully effective. That tends to be a little bit expensive. Uh, the third thing is the uh, ventilation, extraction. Um, most apartments are designed with just fenestration on two sides. So you have maybe, a, and very often just on one, you have windows on one elevation only, and you're surrounded on the other three sides by other apartments. So you're not getting a natural cross flow of ventilation. Um, the old uh, cottages and houses, uh, and certainly any uh, houses built in the countryside where there is space is not an issue, will have windows in front and back of the house. You can open windows front and back and get a fresh air flow and a very quick air change in the house. But unfortunately with apartments, uh, you don't have that uh, simple uh, cross flow of air. And usually also with apartments, the bathroom and the kitchen are located on those inner walls uh, away from windows. So mechanical ventilation, extraction fans are critical. Most apartments have them, but they're just what we would call Mickey Mouse fans. They're, they're, they're fine to extract air from a bathroom through the wall, through a 300 mil 12 inch wall, but no more. And unfortunately with most apartments, with the, with the bathroom say being located on an inner wall, the fan is ducted out through a pipe to the front of the building, which could be anything from six to eight meters in length. Or worse than that, they're on the ground floor and it's ducted up through three, maybe four floors. Um, of, of um, uh, uh, you know of distance above, so the small uh, expel air fan that's there is simply not capable of getting the air change, the air air change that's required. So um, it's important that first of all mechanical vents are working. The other problem with them is that most occupants will switch off the isolator switch. So when they turn on the bathroom light, the fan is not working, and again that that's a, that's a housekeeping issue. Um, so the, the three steps then in reducing condensation, the three, the three buzzwords are ventilation, heating and insulation. Uh, improving ventilation fresh air is often very simple, just a matter of checking the fence as we said. Increasing heating, now a lot of apartments will just simply have the electrical convector heaters. Most people are out during the day, so the convector heaters are on for an hour in the morning and a couple of hours in the evening, so there's no real heat sink uh, in, 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 in the apartment. So it cools down as quickly as it warms up, particularly with insulation on the inside walls. So the, 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 the heating systems tend to be inadequate on their own in handling and uh, controlling ventilation. Improving the insulation, uh, we mentioned that previously, that, that's, that's probably the most expensive way to, to keep down on insulation. So it's, it's a combination of all three very often the simplest and most effective is uh, ventilation. Um, this is just a case study very briefly we were involved in very severe mold growth and it really looked terrible but um, it was a landlord and tenant dispute 
that was heading for the PRTB and we had to do a report and we found that it was a combination of two things. Um, the tenant wasn't properly managing the apartment but also the, the landlord was neglecting to look after basics like ventilation, extraction and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, windows weren't being opened, uh, the isolator switch was off, uh, there was inadequate fans in the internal room and a, a small thing to do with a, a bathroom for most landlords if they're having problems with condensation is to tile the bathroom walls. In this instance it was just a painted uh, plastered, uh, plasterboard lined and pl skin finished wall so it was easier for mould to uh, rest on that wall and grow whereas with tiling um, it's a smoother surface, easier to keep clean so that, that can help reduce uh, mould particularly if you're ha having difficulty in getting the adequate air changes and it, it, it certainly doesn't look as bad. Um, fire uh, very much in uh, current vogue as it were, everybody's talking about fire um, and I suppose in, in some ways the assigned certifier's role will manage construction much better now and we certainly won't have inherent issues but most of the fire problems in apartment blocks are down to either workmanship or design um, and um, the uh, Prairie Hall I guess has brought it to everyone's attention and it's, it's a huge concern for owner managers uh, particularly in trying to understand if their building is safe um, and as one of the simple things you can do is a uh, fire audit uh, have the basics looked at now I know you can't look into cavities and see if the cavity barriers are there um, but if you have a, a, a preliminary fire audit done and things like the uh, service risers are properly fire lined and fire sealed and that service penetrations are properly fire sealed it will give you a good feel for the overall construction of the unit and if those basics are not there then it might be worth uh, getting a boroscope done to check the, um, the uh, cavity fire barriers. Um, so with, with the service risers they're probably the the, the, the one area that you need to be satisfied that uh, fire separation is in place so you'll either have an open fire riser top to bottom with adequate fire doors or you'll have it fire sealed at each floor level and if it's fire sealed at each floor level it's very important that the uh, all service risers, all pipes, all vents are adequately sleeved where they go through the firewall and the contractors now doing that will provide you with a certificate for each service duct and that's well worth having on your uh, health and safety file. Uh, the AOVs, the automatic opening vents, a huge area of problem and while a lot of property managers get them serviced annually uh, that may not be enough. Uh, the problems that we are coming across is they're, they're all opening together or they're not linked to the fire alarm system so it's, it's not enough to be able to say that you're getting them maintained uh, you, you must also be satisfied that they're working properly and as required in the event of a fire. Uh, simple checks you can carry out yourself as a property manager uh, fire sleeves where they should be so obviously any compartment walls um, both of those photographs were taken um, in basement car parks you can see on the left there is no attempt at all to fire seal the uh, service pipe penetration uh, the second one there was where there was an actual fire in a car park and um, you can see how the, the fire seal um, would, would come into its own in a situation like that so uh, I guess the, the challenge for uh, a building surveyor when they are called out to a development to look at a problem is to get as much information before going to site as we possibly can and this maybe is where the property manager can help us in providing as much information, as much background to the problem. Uh, safety files can be a good source of information, at least it will have the uh, service certificates from the installers of the various equipment it will have drawings but the problem with 
the drawings on a SEPTI file is that they're not generally as built, even though they're filed as as built. They'll be usually planning drawings which don't have any detail. Under the new building control system now, the assigned certifier has to ensure that a full set of working drawings are on file in the, in the local authority and that those drawings detail everything, including uh, pipe uh, locations and sizes and all that. So from now on, we'll have uh, access to much more information. But at the moment, a big problem for us going out to site is, is drawings and at satisfactory information on those drawings. And we simply don't have that. Uh, simple things that, you're, that you as, as property managers can do is uh, or, or if you have a, a, a good uh, handyman or, or maintenance guy involved in, on, on the development is to inspect uh, roofs and, and that should probably be done twice a year and it's a simple inspection uh, checking rainwater outlets after a dry period any dirt that has gathered, gathered around will, be, will have hardened and a, and a flush of rain will not uh, move it uh, so we are trying to avoid the inevitable build up on a flat roof where you have a blocked outlet uh, water rising rising above the uh, uh, upstands and causing uh, water ingress. So a simple annual check at least will uh, reduce that. Um, I suppose the other thing I mentioned there is uh, insurance and uh, insurance companies are sending out assessors now to look at every claim and it's very difficult with roof in a building built in the last 10, 15 years to prove that the uh, problem is uh, an insured peril. Uh, most of the assessors coming out, they'll come out with the attitude that they're not covering it. So you have to prove that uh, you know, the, the, the claim is an insured peril. And things like poor workmanship they'll identify that straight away and simply not cover that. Uh, inherent design defects, they won't cover that either. So really the only thing that they will cover is storm damage. And with uh, a 10 year old roof, it's, very, it's often very difficult to prove that the defect is the result of storm damage. So that, that can be quite, uh, quite challenging to, to get across the line as it were. Um, So that's uh, it in terms of, of the defects, and I think the best way to deal with defects is questions and answers. But just one other thing to mention to you is the uh, Building Investment Fund. fund. Um, part of that will be a planned maintenance program over usually a 20-year period. And I think that is very useful for property managers to be able to look at that uh, annually and see what big items of work are coming up. And if you've, if you've got it done and it's identified uh, life cycles of various different elements of construction, it can make uh, your maintenance work for that year very simple. It can cut down on maintenance, it can cut down on a lot of expensive work. Um, now I know it's difficult when you look at a roof that's uh, 15 years old maybe and it is due a recovering. If it's not leaking it's very hard to uh, convince uh, property owners that they perhaps should spend uh, money replacing that roof now. So I, I accept that that, that that can be quite uh, challenging. But a, a planned maintenance program, which is part of a BIF, obviously you guys need the BIF, Building Investment Fund, to work out your service charge and make sure that you have adequate cover in that sense. But the most important part of any BIF is the planned maintenance program, which will identify all the elements, their life cycle, when they're likely to require replacement, and then adding to that a cost factor, which gives you your Building Investment Fund. So. I would ask Andrew to join me for the questions and answers and we'd be delighted to take any, any uh, queries you have and as I always say if we can't answer them now we'll get back to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Anyone want to kick off? Stephen. Yes. A troll call roof. Yeah. And, you know, I was up there a, a few weeks back, and there was trees growing out, outlets, and there was debris building up in corners. And um, again, I was, I was recommending maybe we should be doing an annual check on the on the roof. 
the question was raised, is there, is there, like, because it, it can be very easy to puncture and it's for every yeah. is there, I don't know, a, a, an additional layer of a protective paint you can put on that makes a control car roof or, or, or is it? Is it no. Uh, yeah. Well, the trocol tends to be a mechanically fixed uh, single layer application, so it's it's it's, it's fixed at, at various points. Um, it's a pretty tough uh, roof covering, um, but it, and it can be patch repaired, and it is probably one of the few roofing products that can be satisfactorily tested by a spark test. Um, but there's, you know, it 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 will tear. It doesn't have any protection over it, and the, 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 not that I'm aware of. There's no Add on. Yeah, I suppose su subject to uh, walkways, you know, so if you've got a lot of plant uh, that's up there, so you, you know you're going to have to be doing quarterly or annual servicing, you can get walkways that are a slightly hard material that outlines a designated place for maintenance staff to be walking. Mm -hmm. Paul, do you want you Andrew to come closer to the mic? Andrew, you might want to come over closer to the mic just to. So you can, you can get a, a walkway system, which is a secondary uh, layer that can apply across the single ply membrane system. So it's a designated walkway area. So it's a designated walkway area. I suppose the, the great difficulty that we would see a lot of times is you know, you get uh, maintenance guys that have gone up, and the difficulty with a, a sort of a single ply or troke wall system is that a stone on the bottom of your shoe could puncture it. You know, anything that is quite, quite easily. Uh, quite easy to damage it, even if they are doing their maintenance, you know, they're taking screws out of air conditioning systems or to get into lift shafts, so all of a sudden the screw falls down and then somebody stands on the screw, um, and then obviously you're going to start to get uh, water penetration through at that point. Yeah, um, and even the, like the upstands now, you can see that the lamps sort of coming loose and the conductors able to stick as sort of screwdriver underneath, you can see the raised lamps and such, and yeah. the only way of finding that out was regular tests or, or less leak corrosion, you know? Yeah, well, it, I suppose the big difficulty with your, your single plink ply system is you're either having to do, you know, put in place that you're going to do a spark test to try to identify if there are any weak points in the system. Um, with, with a tropo system, it's going to be heat fixed in place, so all the seals are heat fixed, so by the sounds of it, those seals are starting to, to go on, on, on your roof there at that time. So again, I don't know, you know looking at the age of the roof, um, if, if, it's, if it's a little bit older, um, so therefore it's had a little bit more wear and tear but then you know again all down to the traffic levels that come across the roof itself you know so whether it is a, a significant trafficked area in terms of trying to get to uh, to machinery and, and plant um, but specifically I know you just mentioned there about you know plant growth coming out of your rainwater outlets what you need to be quite careful there is a lot of the single ply systems have a, a siphonic drainage system which is a narrow quite a narrow bore uh, drainage system so they can get blocked very very quickly so again I what sort of Pat was saying was you know get to know your roof and um, you know you know it's a single ply system you know it's going to have a four inch down pipe or a hundred mil down pipe versus a, a 52 millimeter down pipe and um, which is down to two and a half inches you know so they're going to block an awful lot quicker so if you know the type of roofing system you have and, and maybe the drainage outlets that are there whether you can say to yourself well I definitely have to get onto this roof twice a year or maybe I can extend it out a little bit longer, so it's hmm. it's been able to, to a certain extent, weight the issues. So, so they said, well, I, I need to definitely look at my rainwater outlets, so I need to look at this other item in, in particular. So there's a number of variance factors that you need to just be mindful of. You mentioned there uh, spark test twice. What's what's involved in the completion of the spark test, and how? Like I know you mentioned, trocol is quite effective on trocol, but how effective is it at determining every weakness on a roof? I suppose nothing, nothing's 100% proof. Um, you know, it's very, very good. Certainly, with uh, you know a roofing product that you know a trocal system is looking at a 30-year life expectancy. You know, but if you've got a, a mineral felt, it's looking at a 15-year life expectancy. So with trocal, it's going to be around an awful lot longer. You know, so it's likely to have had an awful lot more wear and tear. And um, the spark tests are, are pretty good um, in terms of identifying most leaks. They're not foolproof. Um, how, how exactly, what, what's involved in carrying out a spark test or what do they use to test the roof? Uh, work? They have two uh, diodes on sort of a, a, an electronic device and as it's going through, it's, it's a bit like a moisture meter um, so that the passage of the current going from one diode to the next, so if, if they get a, a spark in the system, it's telling them that there's, there's potentially a failure at that point or a weak point and they're able to isolate it down pretty close to where there is a potential failure within the roofing system itself. 
Have you any guidance for the long term cost of replacing roofs like Procal systems? How much per square meter is there a rule of thumb figure? Well, I think with, with costs, uh, because every roof is so different, and it, it, one of the big factors in cost is upstands. So if you have a lot of parapet walls, or you have um, you know, penetrations in the roof, the cost in, in, increases. Uh, we, we're always trying to get a, a rate per square meter that we're comfortable with, but it's, it, it just differs f from every roof, and it's not, it's not really possible. Even contractors won't give you a guide. They'll insist on seeing the roof and, and doing a measurement particularly off the parapet, the, the amount of upstands. Um, well, do you have a figure that's not less than? <laughs> uh, 50, yeah, yeah, 50 yeah. euro a meter squared would be a kind of a very rough estimate, but it, it will vary depending on the size of the roof, the amount of interruptions on the roof, and whether or not you're also looking at doing decking and insulation. Um, but I suppose 50 euro is a rate I'd have in my head for a very rough estimate on, on, our, on our roof, that's... Uh, yeah. For felt. For felt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you go into the, the single ply systems, you know, a lot of them are approved installers only. Um, you know, certain products will only go with that particular product. Um, so you need to know what product you actually have on your roof, um, whether it be a, a, a trocal or a brass system. You know, with the brass system, you can only use brass with it. You know, so you can't apply a trocal membrane to, to a brass system. So again, they've kind of cornered the market there, so they know you have to come back to their product because nothing else will adhere to it. And generally, when they're doing it, uh, when roofers are doing a, a, a larger roof where you have uh, an inverted roof with the insulation and the pea gravel or ballast on top of the felt, they'll be doing it in sections, they'll be moving, and a decision will be made then as they go whether or not the insulation can be reused usually they would, the opportunity will be taken to put down new insulation at that stage. So it does tend to be quite labour intensive and in that instance the rate would go up as well. Yeah. Have you any advice on future installation of PV solar panels on these roofs? Well, apart from saying do not put them on the roof, uh, uh, we wouldn't have any experience in that. It's quite a, a specialist area, uh, so it wouldn't be our area of expertise. We would normally look to an M&E consultant for that. I don't know if you have any yeah, well, to, to, to add to that, Andrew. I don't know whether your question is more about if, if an apartment complex wishes to install them to, in an attempt to try to reduce their energy running costs. Um, I suppose, again, it's looking at your roof and what you have. If you've got a trocal system and we're potentially still within warranty, um, you wouldn't be recommending putting down your paving slabs to take the weight of the uh, solar panels because that's obviously going to, going to affect your warranty to a certain extent. Um, so I suppose it's the, the fixing of the system uh, and it being placed in onto the roof to ensure that it, during its installation it's not going to cause any puncture holes or issues in itself. Um, the uh, penetrations then for the actual service connections, so all the pipe work and uh, uh, flow, flow and return pipes that would be installed with that system as well. So where they're positioned Again, in Pat's slide, we're looking at uh, the installations going through the parapet. So it's whether there's, the roof has already been designed with a designated service route that we can utilize, or whether you're actually going to see about installing another one. So there's a little bit of thought just needed um, in terms of where you do that installation. And I suppose the other big thing just to check is with your insurance company um, as to whether they're going to have any issues with the installation of new materials or new products on the roof <coughs> and whether they're sort of saying well look you've changed what we had initially insured um, and therefore we're either wanting to increase our premium or we're wanting to caveat your insurance policy to a certain extent to sort of limit your opportunity for claim. Um, I know with one case I'm dealing with at the moment which is going to be going to court, um, a tenant had installed a decking system on top of an asphalt roof which was starting to deteriorate the system and it was actually the insurance company that put a significant amount of weight on uh, the management company and the OMC in terms of having the decking removed because their view was you can't inspect 100% of this roof and therefore you can't maintain it and on the basis that you can't inspect it and or maintain it uh, you're going to have an insurance issue and we may not cover that particular roof section. So again it's, it's the insurance side of things, it's the one that might catch you out as well.
Well, if anybody doesn't want to ask a question now, please do email either myself or Andrew. Uh, both uh, Andrew's Andrew at McGovernSavares, I'm Pat at McGovernSavares.ie, and we'd we'll be delighted to, uh, if we can, uh, uh, answer the question or, or, or direct you uh, one way or another. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.